Dr. Nasser is a nephrologist with Nephrology Associates of Kentucky Anna. He received his doctorate degree from the University of Damascus School of Medicine. He completed an internal medicine residency at Atlantic City Medical Center and a nephrology fellowship at Presbyterian University of the Pennsylvania Medical Center. So Dr. Nasser, please teach us about chronic kidney disease. Let me try to see if I can share my screen. Uh, we have your screen, now we just need the presentation. Yes, I'm trying to find it, I cannot. I did that when I did, that. if you can uh, share my presentation, I would be very grateful. So I wouldn't waste your time here. Okay, they're, they're pulling it up currently. All right. All right, great. Uh, the first important part about chronic kidney disease, first of all, thank you for inviting me to talk to you all about this. And I look at primary care provider as the front uh, line uh, defense against chronic kidney disease. So we need to figure out how to diagnose the chronic kidney disease or the kidney disease in timely fashion and trying to mitigate the progression of chronic kidney disease. And that's definitely uh, uh, will, will help us to save a lot of money. And uh, next slide, please. If you look at a 50-year-old Hispanic female, which was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at age 30, she has taken medication as prescribed since diagnosis. The fact that she has confirmed diabetes puts the patient at higher risk for kidney failure and cardiovascular disease. Higher risk for kidney failure only, higher risk for cardiovascular disease only, and none of the above. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Next slide, please. When you look at 42-year-old African-American man with diabetic nephropathy and hypertension who has stable GFR 25 ml per minute, observational study of early as compared to late nephrology referral have demonstrated which of the following? Reduced one-year mortality, increased mean hospital days, no change in serum albumin at the initiation of dialysis or, uh, or kidney transplant, decreased in hematocrit at the initiation of dialysis or kidney transplant, or delayed referral for kidney transplant. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Next slide. So the most important part is for us to define what chronic kidney disease. And from my presentation, there's one slide missing. I couldn't locate it. Uh, you have to have three months of abnormality of either creatinine or uh, urinary sediment, or you have abnormal imaging, or you have a potassium issue, for instance, or electrolyte, especially potassium uh, abnormality and kidney stones. So that will put us with the category of chronic kidney disease. We have to have three months of uh, abnormality. Uh, next slide, please. The chronic kidney disease has a huge uh, public burden. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. About 26 million American, and the number is rising every year, are affected. Prevalence about 11 to 14 percent of adult population. Uh, and increased risk for all cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, kidney failure, uh, leading dialysis, and significant uh, decree, uh, uh, decrease in uh, life expectancy and longevity. And there's six-fold increase in mortality rate when you have diabetes and chronic kidney disease combined. Proportionately affect more African American and Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander and American Indian. Uh, that can be debated about, is it uh, socioeconomics or is it genetics or it is 
I believe it's all the above and still uh, no clear answer why other than I believe there's a lot of genetic uh, studying, especially right now we know about the a APLO1, uh, uh, which is a gene if you have two uh, uh, expressions that will increase the risk of uh, having kidney disease, especially in African American. So I believe that's something we need to be aware of and pay attention to this particular population. Next slide, please. So when you look at cardiovascular disease by itself is terrible. Diabetes is terrible. Chronic kidney disease is terrible. But can you imagine that red zone? That is the worst place for any patient to be in because their uh, morbidity, mortality, quality of life, and longevity all impacted by that. Uh, next slide. So the approach to chronic kidney disease should be considered a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so when you look at uh, the, the cost, the expenditure for chronic kidney disease, if you look at ESRD patient, end stage renal disease patient on dialysis, they represent approximately half a percent of the Medicare population then the cost for this population is 7% of the Medicare budget. That's a huge discrepancy. And how can we uh, cut down on the cost is by doing uh, early, early detection and uh, trying to mitigate the risk and slow down the progression of the chronic kidney disease and hopefully we'll be able to save money. This grow, the growth of ESRD is probably going to be unsustainable in the future. Next slide. So uh, the key is how we're going to slow down the progression of chronic kidney disease. But before we do that, let us go to the next slide and define uh, a few risk factors. So we have modifiable risk factor, diabetes, hypertension, history of acute kidney injury, and frequent non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug use. Diabetes, if we will be able to uh, treat early and uh, effectively and keep their uh, glycemic control and hemoglobin A1C, that hopefully will cut down on the rate of uh, albuminuria, and that will help keep the patient away from the realm of chronic kidney disease. Hypertension, if we detect the hypertension early and the treat early and aggressively and keep the patient's blood pressure in the 130, 120, 130, over 80, I think the patient will have less chances of uh, progressing to uh, kidney disease. A history of acute kidney injury Sometimes we have no control over that. If a patient gets uh, dehydration, uh, uh, major surgery, catastrophic event. But if we will try to educate our patients, especially the one who has heart disease uh, and they're requiring diuretics and other medication like ACE and ARBs, to keep their blood pressure under control, trying to explain to them if they start having nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and getting ill, poor appetite, to back off this medication and communicate with their primary care provider, because that will be a strategy to uh, prevent acute kidney injury in this population. The use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, we have to be very uh, uh, vigilant about the cause of that and the frequency of its use. So that should be part of the questionnaire we have whenever we see a patient in our office. The non-modifiable, you know, if you have family history or genetic predisposition, there's nothing we can do about that other than we will try to early detection and try to treat and try to slow down the progress of kidney disease. If you have somebody who is elderly, and their GFR uh, normally declines as we age. Over age 30 to 40, we lose 1% of our GFR. But their, our creatinine would not change because as we age, our muscle mass shrinks slowly. The other uh, issue about race, ethnicity, minority status, socioeconomic, I think the society has to work on that. But when we have patients 
who fits in that category, early detection is very, very important. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we screen and define chronic kidney disease? Next slide, please. If you look at uh, uh, CKD screening, the ACR is albumin to creatinine ratio done on a random first voided or second voided urine in the morning. We, we have a lot of people don't have that. There's no GFR testing. Uh, so if we have a patient who is Part of the, I'm not going to take an 18 year old individual, his healthy marathon runner, uh, absolutely perfect uh, metrics, biometrics. I don't think that person I will screen, but if I have somebody who uh, come in for evaluation and they have some medical issues, I think we need to do the pro albumin to creatine ratio. We need to check their creatinine, their GFR, their electrolytes, hemoglobin, and uh, do a urinalysis to screen for those patients, and then the next step to do uh, uh, intervention. Next, please. So when, when you do these studies, it's demonstrated that your behavior towards uh, chronic kidney disease improves when you realize that increased urinary albumin testing, increased appropriate use of ACE, or ARB, avoidance of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, especially prescribing them for a prolonged period of time, and then when to ask the nephrologist to be a partner with you, but you are still the main, you are the captain of the ship, the nephrologist will be like a navigator, and you have the final say in any recommendation. Next, please. The screening tool, you need to consider the best overall index of kidney function. There's a lot of debate, is creatinine, is testosterone C, is this or that. At this point, what we have, a cheap, inexpensive way to determine kidney function is to do serum creatinine and look at GFR, and there's multiple uh, equations used by different labs uh, mainly the MDRD, uh, which is the, the older one, then now CKD Epi. I would recommend for everybody to try to have the CKD Epi calculator available so you will look at your uh, patient GFR if, if there's some uh, question about the validity of the other numbers. Then you do the creatinine clearance in the old-fashioned way, the Cockrot Galt, but that's really not very helpful. Uh, so always you can go to the National Kidney Foundation website and get GFR calculator. It's very important to know the patient GFR because that will uh, help you with the safety of prescribing drugs. Next, please. So when we look at your uh, urine uh, protein or albumin excretion uh, in our patient, that is a marker for kidney disease, but also it is a marker for increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So if you have a patient who have heart disease or diabetes, not necessarily heart disease, when you see their albumin in the urine, that means they have increased risk of car, uh, vascular disease. So uh, at, uh, paying attention to this group of patients also uh, will allow us to do early intervention and to treat them aggressively and decrease the cost of uh, more aggressive treatment like bypass, like PCIs, and what have you. Next slide, please. Uh, one point about the protein to creatinine ratio or albumin to creatinine ratio, that can be substitute in many, many cases for 24 hour urine collection. And it's desirable to do the first AM urine sample or the second voided urine of the morning because rats reflect when the patient was lying down in bed, there's no evidence or uh, impact of uh, 
orthostatic proteinuria and what have you. And that's the ratio, the absolute number. If you look at milligram per gram, that will allow you to, to extrapolate that mean the patient, let us say the absolute number of uh, albumin to creatinine ratio is 300. That means this patient, if you do 24 hour urine collection, most likely you will get 300 milligram in 24 hours. If you get uh, 3,000, that means the patient probably have 3,000 milligram of protein. So it's really important to, to know that. For me, when I see a lot of patients, especially elderly patients, they have abnormal GFR, but if their GFR is greater than 60 and their protein to creatinine ratio or albumin to less than 30 milligram per gram, then this patient very unlikely to have kidney disease and it's probably it changes in GFR associated with aging. We have to be careful which patient to tell them you have kidney disease because it's frightening to the patient and it also leads to unnecessary testing and pushing for more evaluation and referral where it should not be. So we try to, uh, that's the beginning for the evaluation. Next, please. So when you look at uh, the classification of uh, chronic kidney disease, you have stage one when you have GFR greater than 90, but you have evidence of damage uh, to the kidney, like uh, imaging, cystic disease, stone disease, uh, severe uh, potassium abnormality and what have you. Then you have some damage to the kidney, GFR decreased 60 to 89, that will make it stage two. Still, if you don't have much protein, that is in my book, for all intents and purposes, normal kidney function, and we should, especially in older patients. And when we look at the GFR 30 to 59, that is uh, uh, definitely chronic kidney disease, and that's where we can make the most difference by uh, mitigating the progress of the kidney disease by being aggressive and managing their blood pressure, glycemic control, me medication uh, management, and making sure all uh, safety measures are done. Then when you have stage four, which start at uh, 29, between 15 to 29, those are the patient at the highest risk of uh, advancement to end the stage renal disease. If you look at stage one, two, and three, uh, the cost per year may be $12,000 for Medicare or other insurer. When you go down to, to uh, CKD four and five who are not on dialysis, you're talking about forty to $50,000 a year cost. And when you hit dialysis, your cost is greater than 80,000 a year. That is a huge cost, and we, we should be uh, working on cutting the cost because uh, value-based care is coming your way and my way, and eventually we are going to be penalized for the more cost we, we do. Next slide, please. This is very important because now we are looking at uh, the albuminuria. You have A1, A2, and A3. So when your uh, albumin to creatinine ratio less than 30 milligram per gram, that make it A1. A2 will be 30 to 299 milligram per gram, and A3 greater than 300 milligram per gram. And you look at the classification right now we have for uh, CKD, you have G1, which is CKD1, G2, CKD2. Then we have G3A, which is when the GFR 45 to 59, G3B 30 to 44, and so forth, the other one. So you look at the color uh, panel here. If you have somebody who had G1 or G2 and they have no protein, if you see the color is green. If they have a little bit of protein, that means they have more risk of progressing. If they have yellow, they, they're going to progress without question. When you look at G3A, and you, 
that's by itself decreased GFR. They have a problem even when they don't have protein in the urine, but when they don't have a protein in the urine or they are A1, that means the progression for this patient is probably going to be at slower rate. So we have to exercise uh, 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 caution and uh, uh, education for the patient to avoid non-steroidal and nephrotoxic agent. But when you look at CKD or G3A with A2, those are the patients who will have more risk. And everything in the red is really higher risk for them to progress toward end-stage renal disease. Next. Next. So what are our goals for the care for the patient with the chronic kidney disease? It's to get the blood pressure control. When they have no protein in the urine, 140 over 90 or less is acceptable. But to be honest with you, the best thing for all your patients with CKD diagnosis, less than 130 over 80, that's very important. And we need to individualize target uh, according to the patient age, because of chronic kidney, uh, cardiovascular disease, other comorbidities. You cannot take an 85-year-old and say, I'm going to do 120 over 80, 130 over 80. They probably could not stand. And uh, the younger people, you may want to be more aggressive. Definitely, we have to consider ACE or ARB anytime there is a hint of protein in the urine. Uh, next. Okay, let us let us go further because I want to talk about uh, uh, next again. Again, please. Again. Again. Because I don't think we have a lot of time to talk about those issues. Again, please. One more. What can primary care practitioner do? Evaluate and manage anemia, malnutrition, i.e. their albumin level should be four or greater. Monitor calcium, phosphorus, parathyroid hormone, PTH, and vitamin D, and make adjustment with this treatment to minimize metabolic bone disease, to decrease risk of fractures, and, uh, and uh, uh, small vessel calcification. We need to make sure we have a dietitian with nutritional guidance and consider safety issue for chronic kidney disease. And when to consult a nephrologist. I believe having a nephrology consult on a patient to have CKD3 uh, and proteinuria, it probably will be uh, to give guidance and you will manage the patient. When we get to CKD4 and 5, I think it should be co-management. And uh, that will be very important. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. The time is really running. Uh, next one, please. Next one. Oh, please keep that one, that one for us, uh, the previous slide. So when you look at the baseline rate of renal function loss, that's very important if you are aware of the patient having chronic kidney disease, having non-steroidal given for gout, uh, you will notice there's drop. They got a contrast for heart cath they have an infection and you end up giving them aminoglycoside. You start to diurese aggressively, ACE, ARB, uh, patient becoming hypotensive, as mentioned earlier. See how that will decline. So we need to mitigate that, the under the line interventions to cut down on the non-steroidal, uh, making sure we are not gonna do CT with uh, contrast, doing a, a heart cast unless absolutely necessary. When infection, uh, there we need to treat with less nephrotoxic agents, unless it's the only option. And uh, uh, educating our, our patient about 
if they are on ACE, are uh, diuretics, if they have GI symptoms, poor appetite, losing weight, they need to communicate with you so we can cut down on this medication and prevent the uh, progression toward ESRD. Next one, please. So medication error are extremely important. There's definite nephrotoxic medication. There's improper dosing or inadequate monitoring. So when, when you take somebody on phenofibrate, phenofibrate is great. If they get to GFR of 30, probably we need to stop it. If they have rapid decline in their GFR, we need to probably stop it before they get to 30 because you never know how quickly they will get there, then they will have risk of rhabdomyolysis and what have you. Uh, we need to pay attention to our electrolyte, hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia, hypermagnesemia, hyperphosphatemia, and treat those patients. Those are safety issue because uh, if the patient become hypoglycemic, when you treat them because insulin is metabolized in the kidney, in the proximal tubule. If the patient uh, start having declined kidney function, they may require lowering their insulin dose. If you keep the same dose, they may have uh, hypoglycemia while asleep and brain damage. Hypermagnesemia has its problem. Hyperphosphatemia lead to metabolic bone disease, calcification, uh, and, uh, of the small blood vessel and worsening the cardiovascular disease. And multi-drug resistant infection, so we need to be very careful in prescribing antibiotics as much as possible. Also, if the patient has chronic kidney disease, uh, we need to start thinking what is the future going to be for this patient. They're going to be need hemodialysis, AV fistula. So we have to start the conversation and that's where nephrology and primary care will be working together. I think my time is almost up. Uh, those are the thing about the iodinated contrast. Try to avoid them as much as possible. Yes, sir. Dr. Jennings, do I have more time? Just another couple minutes. Okay, great. Uh, remember gadolinium-based contrast. Uh, if you have somebody who had the uh, CKD uh, greater than, with GFR less than 45, you start to worry about nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. And uh, our colleagues in the radiology department, they always check the creatinine before giving gadolinium to prevent that. The sodium phosphate bowel prep used to be very popular in uh, preparation for uh, GI, uh, for uh, colonoscopy right now. This is out of favor. It proven uh, patient getting those type of bowel prep have acute phosphate nephropathy leading to end stage renal disease. So if you have a patient with chronic kidney disease, you need to make sure to tell them not to take any laxative which is containing fleet phospho soda because that can lead to acute kidney injury. Um, it's important to manage our patient, their uh, fluid management, uh, to keep uvolemia without causing hypotension or causing a acute kidney injury. If they have a congestive heart failure, that will put us in a different uh, category, cardiorenal syndrome. Uh, that's probably out of the scope of this discussion. I believe that's all what I have to say for you guys. Thank you very much for a very good presentation. I know we have probably a half a dozen